You seem, you seem very excited, very energized. Let's begin this morning. We just sang about it. Let's begin this morning by just praising the Lord out loud. Let him know how much you love him, how good he has been to you. Guys, we're in a series. You've been in it for the last month with us. It's called The Kindness Campaign. And uh, we've noticed that uh, it is definitely unlike a lot of campaigns going on these days. This is the kindness campaign that we're in the middle of. Today we're talking about undercover kindness. I would like you to grab your Bibles, your notes, your pens. Also, I want you to know that today is Communion Sunday on this United Sunday. Uh, if you did not receive one of these, when you came in through those doors, just raise your hand and somebody will find you, get to you right away so we can take communion together at the end of today's message. Man, it's so good to see you guys. Also, let's give the, the choir and the, the, the um, <laughs> round of applause. They do a great job every Sunday. We appreciate you guys so much. All right. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we again come this morning to you together, uh, united as one, as, as, as your family. Father, as we come to you, we ask that you would show us even more what you would have us to be, what you would have us to do, how you would have us to live, and how you would have us to act in this world in which you've put us. Father, we're, we ask that you will show us the opportunities that you put in front of us each and every day to live out this love that we have for you. Father, may this love from you flow through us to this world in which we live. May it come out in kindness. May it come out in the words that we say and the way that we give to one another. May your love flow and may people see it and know, know you. Father, help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, uh, I don't know if you're like this, but I've always kind of dreamed of how cool it would be to be an undercover agent. <laughs> I can't get enough of the movies, you know? I love the movies every once in a while when I'm traveling and my wife is worried about me traveling. I'll look at her and say, I am Jason Bourne. Okay. <laughs> she doesn't always agree with that, but I believe it deep down here. Most recently, the the movie that caught my attention flying on a plane, I don't watch a lot of movies, but when I'm on a plane to take up time, I'll, I'll see what they have showing. And I came across a movie called Equalizer. Anybody know Equalizer? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, man. I, I now am Denzel Washington, okay? <laughs> Forget Jason Bourne, okay? Man, Denzel, he's got it, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I love, I, I, you, know, you know, I think the thing I love so much about it is uh, he's so unassuming, you know? He's somebody you could pass on the street and, and you wouldn't know that's the equalizer. He's somebody that is always surprising and shocking the bad guys. They think he's harmless. He could do nothing, but oh, man, they are sorely wrong. When Denzel gets going, man, the way that he equalizes everything. Oh, if I could be that. If only I could be that, right? And that deep calling inside of me, and I believe actually it's a deep calling inside of you, is what if God has a special mission, a special plan? What if there is that special calling that he has called us to in this world in which we live? And it'd be, it'd be one of those things where he, he says, no, 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 uh, don't let anybody know about it, the good that you do. Uh, in fact, go undercover and, and let me work through you in ways you never dreamed possible. Let me be that one that is, that is moving through you in remarkable ways to make a difference, to love, to, to be that light in this world in which we live. In fact, that is our calling. That is exactly our calling. 
That is exactly what we have been called to be and to do here in this world and on this planet. And, and I would go so far as to say in this community, in your neighborhood, in your home. In your home. Jesus said this. He said, I've got to warn you about something, okay? I've got to warn you. And, and by the way, how's this kindness campaign been going? You, you guys, uh, uh, has, has anybody been kind to you? Huh? Yes. Yeah? Uh, have you been kind to people? Huh? Have, have, have you found that sometimes it's really hard to be kind to people? Huh? <laughs> but you're kind anyway, right? And that's, that's where we're at. And, that's where, and, and it's, there's a temptation. There is a temptation that when we are kind to somebody to, to kind of go, hey, <laughs> you guys see what I just did? How amazing was that? And Jesus says, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I got to warn you about this, okay? We're going to take the giving to another level. We're going to take the kindness to a whole other level here today. And this is, this is how it goes. Jesus says this, watch out, be careful. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others. For he says, you will lose the reward from your heavenly father. Instead, when you give to someone in need, he says, don't do as the hypocrites do. Blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity, to their kindness. He says, I tell you the truth. They have received all the reward that they will ever get. He says, but you, but you, but you, when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. And so there it is. There is the word of God. Those are the words of Jesus concerning our kindness, concerning our giving. How many of you, how many of you would be honest? How many of you want to be blessed? Amen. Yeah, you want to be blessed? That should be every hand. Let me ask again. If you're in here going, nah, I don't want to bless. <laughs> no. Let me ask again, how many of you want to be blessed? Yeah. And Jesus said, you're more blessed when you give than you when you receive. If you really want to be blessed, he says, become a great giver. Become good at giving. Become great at giving. Learn how to give. You're more blessed when you give than when you receive. Today we're looking at that scripture that we just read up here. Jesus talking about how it is that we should give and give secretly. But I'm going to give you several things, and, and I'm going to tell you right from the start, when you write these things down, they're going to sometimes seem quite opposite, okay? But, but you'll see in a moment how they come together in what Jesus is saying here. How it is that you and I can become great at giving. Guys, the challenge today is just we're going to take our giving to a whole other level. How to become great at giving, number one, Jesus says give secretly, give secretly, and then I want to tell you, give publicly. What? You just said secretly, and now you're saying publicly. Well, we find both in Scripture, but it's not about just being secret and being public. It's about who it's being done for. That's what he's pointing to. Matthew 6, verses 1, verse 1, we just read, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly. And then I want you to underline this next phrase. What is it? To be admired by others. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly. To be admired by others. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Uh, everybody put your hands out like that, okay? Yeah. Your left hand, don't let this know what this is doing. That's kind of weird, isn't it? What in the world is he talking about? How can, how can this not know what this is doing? How many of you ever, you ever argue with yourself? <laughs> Do you? I, man, I argue with myself. I argue my, with myself when, when I see somebody in need, 
and I hear that voice saying, hey, why don't you give to that person in need? Why don't you help them out a little bit? And then there's a side of me going, you can't afford it. And there's the other one saying, quit worrying about affording it. That person's in need. And the other side over here is going, but, but wait a second, man. Maybe, maybe, maybe you need it more than they need it. And then there's this side over here going, no, no, no. Somebody's telling me I need, to, I need to give to this person. I need to do something. And the other side over here is going, man, come on. You're hurting me. You're killing me. We get, we've got to, you ever argue with yourself like that? Yeah. And Jesus is saying, there comes a point even sometime when God's Spirit is saying to you, I want you to do this. I want you to step out and I want you to do this. And you have to look at your other side over there and go, shut up. <laughs> you need to shut up. Because I know it doesn't make sense. And there's a lot of times when, when God calls us to do something, we're going, that doesn't make sense. And I've got to trust him anyway. Left, left hand, right hand. Not only that, guys, I've got to tell you sometimes, my wife is an amazing giver. She's, she's, that's one of her spiritual gifts. She loves to give. And me, not so much. <laughs> it doesn't come as easy for me. It doesn't come as easy for me as it, I think it does for her. And I've got to tell you, sometimes I'm going through our checking account, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> what have you done? And it is my left hand not letting the right hand know what she's doing, right, in this marriage. But you know, that's one of the things I love about her and that, that freedom she has to give, to follow God's prompting. And, and Jesus is saying right here, he goes, There's, there, there comes a time in your giving where, where just give and give so freely that you're not letting, this is not letting this know and this is not letting this know what you're doing. He says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others. When you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You know what it comes down to right here is what I had you underline just a moment ago. Just a moment ago. When you give, are you giving so that you get admiration in return? What this is doing right here is revealing the deep down parts of our heart. In this series, remember the verse we've been talking about? Some of you, you've committed it to memory, right? Uh, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. And remember we talked about the, the deep down parts of the heart where he says get rid of the bitterness, get rid of the filth, get rid of the anger, get rid of the, the, get rid of the work. He says get rid of all that. But so often, it, just, like, just like it says in Scripture, our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And when we are called to give, it shows what's really going on in here. It shows what's real. And, and if I give with the expectation of, I need to get some praise for this. I need to get some way to go, buddy. You're awesome for this. It's showing that deep, deep down is not where it needs to be. To be admired by others. But instead, look what he says in Matthew 5, 16. And this is where we talk about it being public. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for everybody to see it. Wait a second now. We just talked about don't do it publicly so that, don't do it publicly, but then it, it needs to shine out so everybody can see. Where do we fall right here? Again, it comes down to simply this. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see. Why? So that everyone will what? Praise your heavenly Father. What it comes down to right here is whether it's in secret and nobody knows it's you or whether somebody finds out it's you who has followed what he has commanded you to do and it's public and they're praising, well, please don't praise me. At that point we say, now praise the one who sent me. Praise the one who is simply using me. No praise comes to me at all. It's, it's, it's like this. Suppose... Um, suppose you are stranded somewhere and I drive along in my car and I see you and I say, hey, do you need a ride? 
And you're like, yeah, man, could I ever use a ride? And so I say, hop in, and, and I drive you to your destination. And when you get out of the car, you go, oh, wow, thank you, car, so much. You're a great car. <laughs> you don't know what kind of car you are. You're the best car ever. Thank you. And I'd be like, what is wrong with this person? They're thinking of the car, but not the driver of the car? That's messed up, right? In the same way, you and I are simply vehicles by which God can bless others. We're to be the vehicle by, by which God himself is the, is the one who's doing the blessing. He simply uses you and I. It doesn't come from here. It comes from him, does it not? And so for each one of us to see ourselves as, God, I just want to be a vehicle used by you. I want to be that tool in your hand. I want to be whatever it is you want me to be. Use me to bless others. And when other people are blessed, may I get none of the praise and none of the glory. Instead, may you get all the praise and all the honor and all the glory so that people will see you and they will know you above everything else. I thought it was interesting that uh, her name was Jana Harmon. She wrote a book. It's called Atheist Finding God. And in this book, Atheist Finding God, she, she's got done, done a lot of research and talked with uh, a, people who were formerly atheist and how that at some point along the way they found a God, they converted, uh, became a Christian. And uh, she was just curious, what was it that caused them to do that? Uh, did they suddenly uh, learn something they had never learned before? Did they find something they had never seen before? And two-thirds in her book of the people that she interviewed who were once atheists who became a Christian said, it simply happened to me because there were some kind Christians. There were some people who were Christians who were kind to me, and it's that that opened my eyes to God. Kindness, kindness. Give secretly, give publicly, but when you give publicly or when you give secretly, it's not to be admired, but it's simply to praise the God that we serve. Number two, as we up our giving game, we're to give unexpectedly and expectantly. How so? How so? Luke 6.35 says, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without, circle these words, without expecting to be repaid. Love your enemies. Well, that's a tough one, right? Do good to them. That's even tougher. Lend to them ooh, without expecting to be repaid. Expectations. Expectations when we are kind and when we give. But when they're tied with expectations, that's when we begin to create anger and bitterness. The very things that he's saying, put those things away. Don't let those things be harbored in your heart. You see, it's the expectations that we have. If I go to somebody and I give to somebody, and when I give to somebody, I expect that person to be, oh, you're amazing. Thank you so much. You're great. Or if I give to somebody and I have expectations of, well, now they're going to shape up because I gave to them. Well, now they're going to respond this way. Well, now they're going to be nicer. Well, now they're, all these expectations. And when I tie my giving to expectations in other people, it's always going to end in anger, resentment, because they can never measure up to those expectations that you and I have out there for them. And so he's saying when you give, don't give having linked them to those expectations. Even your enemies, even your enemies. He says, give to them, lend to them, but don't expect to be repaid. Don't expect to be repaid by them. He says, then, when you do that, your reward from heaven will be, what are those next two words? Very great. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and who are wicked. And so we say, give unexpectedly, but then also expectantly. What's the difference? 
when I give to somebody who is in need, I don't expect them to be able to repay. I don't expect anything from them. Instead, my expectation is from him. And my expectation can be from him because Jesus promises right here, when you give, this is some, God sees that, and God as your heavenly father is going, that's my kid right there. That's my kid right there. They're giving and not expecting from them, but they're giving and looking to me. And because of that, they can expect. In fact, Jesus says, your reward from heaven will be very great. So where are we looking to? When we choose to give to somebody, when we choose to love on somebody, even our enemies, do we give without expecting from them, but expecting from our Father? I love this last little part right here. Um, it says, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Let me ask, do you know anybody in your, in your life who's unthankful? Huh? Yeah, okay. How about this? Do you know anybody who would go, they're wicked, huh? You know people like that? I mean, they're just, ugh. Unthankful people, wicked people. Now, how many, let me ask you, how many of you know that the unthankful and the, un, uh, and the wicked are yourself? <laughs> oh, wait a second, wait a second. Well, it, it's easy for us to go through life going unthankful, 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 wicked, wick. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so difficult to go unthankful, wicked. Unthankful, wicked. But but that's what he's saying right here. That's what he's saying right here. Even though we might not see it as easy, because, oh my goodness, we're always good at overestimating ourselves, are we not? We're always good at so overestimating ourselves. In fact, uh, recent research was asked by people, how many of you are a good person? And it was over 90% of us say, "I'm I'm I'm a good person, I'm a good person. And oftentimes the way that we call ourselves a good person and not a wicked person is we look at somebody who we think is wicked and go, at least I didn't do that. (laughs) Through comparison, through comparison. But the truth is, God says even our best, even our very best are as filthy rags. Filthy rags. Again, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so you and I instead, when we hear the words of Jesus and say that God has been gracious, that he has given, that he has blessed, even those who are unthankful and wicked, I have to go, that's me. And because that's me, because that's me, am I not acting as my Father in heaven when I'm able to give to somebody who doesn't, who can't? Return. Who, who, and what is that called? It's, called? it's called grace. It's called grace, and it's called living in the flow of grace. What is grace? It's, it's receiving something that you and I, we do not deserve. Nevertheless, we're amazed by how amazing it is, this grace that God gives to us. I think I told you guys that um, several years back, I... Uh, um, I was flying back from Brazil. It's a long flight. It was over eight hours. One of those all, flights where you sleep on, a, on. You're supposed to sleep on the on the plane um, if you can get some rest. But a long flight. And, and uh, I was flying with a buddy of mine. He's a, he's a businessman out of Milwaukee. And uh, uh, we in, he did something. It was it's quite amazing to me because uh, uh, we get to the airport and I go to check into the flight. And I walk up to the counter, there's this lady back there typing on the keyboard, and she looks up at me and says, uh, yes, sir, where are you flying to? And I told her, and she's typing away right there, getting my ticket ready. And that's when I didn't even, I didn't even see it coming. Uh, my buddy walks up behind me, and he hands the lady his credit card and says, uh, I would like to, to purchase a first-class ticket so he can sit up in first class with me. And, and, and the lady behind the counter, she's typing. She looks up at me and says, you got a nice friend. <laughs> and I say, yes, ma'am, I do. You see, I'd never been in first class before. 
I had never flown in first class. And, and here for eight hours on this flight, I was going to be able to fly in, in first class. And, and, and sure enough, she handed me a ticket. And we walked out to the gate, and we got ready to board the flight. And, I, and you, you know, every time before when I'd go and get on a plane, they would tell me to go this way. <laughs> Take a right, sir. This time they told me to go this way. <laughs> and I remember going this way and, and, and getting past that little curtain, you know. <laughs> and guys, I got to tell you, it's a whole other world up there. <laughs> it is a whole other world up there. And man, I walked up, I walked down the aisle and I walked into my seat and the, the seat, I was like, oh my goodness, it's like, whew, look at that room, man. <laughs> whew, sat down in that thing and they have had, they even reclined back like that and, and, and the flight attendants are nicer to you up there too, you know? <laughs> Asking me anything I could get for you and all this stuff and, and I'm just sitting there enjoying all this and looking back to the coach, bunch of losers back there. Oh, man. man, I could get used to this. But you, you know what really sunk in? What really sunk in was, was the fact that I didn't do anything to deserve that. That was grace. I didn't pay for it. I just received it, and I enjoyed it. That's called grace. One of the things we don't realize is each and every day, you and I are sitting in God's amazing grace. We just... And, and we, what's amazing about that is you and I can go our whole lives, just like he said right here. Um, let me read it to you again. He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. How often can we not sit in the grace of God when, it, when it's so extravagant, not even noticing, not even seeing anymore, almost assuming that it's owed to me? <laughs> but, you see, but you see, the moment, the moment we realize the amazing grace of God that we live in each and every day, then that puts us, that puts us in what is called the flow, okay? You know what the flow is? You, you don't want to not live in the flow. You know what the flow is? The flow is where each and every day you're receiving and realizing the amazing grace of God, and you're letting it flow in you and through you and out of you to those around you. But anytime, anytime you forget the grace of God, and you don't realize the grace of God, we have that tendency to, I got to hold on to what it is I've got. And we stop the flow. We stop the flow. We rob ourselves then of the blessings by which God wants to give us as he blesses others through us. Give, give, give. Give unexpectedly and expectantly, expecting the amazing grace of God as we bless those. He's called us to bless. Uh, when, when you give unexpectedly, um, look at who it is that you, let me read it to you this way. James 1.27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. You know what he's saying, right? He, he He's saying, give to people who have no ability to ever repay you. If you really want to live in the flow and the blessing of God, give to somebody who has no capacity to even ever be able to repay you in any way. Find somebody like that. Find an orphan. Find a widow in her distress, he says. Find somebody. That's one of the things I love about so many of these here in this church, you guys. Um, the generosity by which you have blessed, not just people here but around the world, uh, is shocking. It, it is shocking. Do you guys know, probably a lot of you have no idea, that uh, throughout the life of this church, all the different orphanages you've built for children who you'll never see, 
who will never be able to say thank you, who will never ever in any way be able to repay you. Do you guys know that that community had built churches in Thailand to rescue little girls out of sex slavery? Do you guys know that, that you guys built churches in China to people who were impoverished and would never ever be able to build a church themselves? Do you, you guys know that you, get, you built orphanages in Uganda, in India, for children that will never ever be able to say, thank you so much, you've changed my life. You guys built deaf schools in Jamaica. You guys, just recently, just recently, a whole group of you went down to Guatemala and you built homes there. You built homes for widows in their distress. And what a thrill that is. And I know, I know the ones who have been there and you come back and you're so pumped and you're so excited, you're saying, I, I can't get enough of giving. I can't get enough of being, living in this flow of letting God using me in some way, shape, or form. Bless others through me somehow. Give, give, give to those who could never, ever possibly figure out a way to pay you back. And number three, as we up this game, give a little and a lot. Give a little and a lot. What are we talking about here? First of all, I want you to know that your little, what you think is so small, could be a lot for somebody. Your little, God can do a lot with. And the truth about it is, if Scripture, as it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, then when you give, even if you think it's a lot, compared to what God has, it's little. And God is able to take whatever it is that you give, that little, and turn it into something that changes somebody's life in a dramatic way. Little or a lot. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, look what it says. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Uh, you, you, you see where he's going with this? How many of you ever been on a farm? You ever been on a farm? You ever work on a farm? A lot of us are kind of separated out from a farm, but any good farmer knows that if you want a good crop, you got to plant a bunch of seed. You can't expect a big crop if you only put down a few seeds. And it's a principle. It's something that God has established in this world in which we live. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And it's a principle he calls us to live by. And he says, if you want a big crop, then you got to plant some seeds. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. And then he says this, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Let me, let me stop right here. How many of you ever heard a preacher talking about giving in church, huh? Some, some of you are like, that's this today, right now. No. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. And you might never hear a preacher ever say this again. If you're ever in church and a preacher is pressuring you and you feel it is, a preacher is, uh, um, let's send the plate around another time, okay? You know what Scripture says right here? If you're feeling pressured, if, if it's in... He says, that's the time, no, no, not then, not then. That's not the right time to give. So when is the right time to give? Well, let's read. Let's see what it says. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. In other words, he's saying, when you can be ecstatic, about giving, that's the time to give. Cheerfully. Uh, the Greek word, you know what the Greek word uh, here for cheerfully is? Hilaros, H-I-L-A-R-O-S. 
which is where we get the English word? Hilarious. For God loves a hilarious giver. You, you ever been sitting in church and you're about to give and you're like, this is so great, man. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> How can you get there? How can you be there? Are you there? Years ago, and a lot of people think it's kind of weird, but uh, years ago, um, and when I say a lot of people think it's weird, if you've been here any time at all here at Community, we get ready to take the offering, and we'll say, you guys ready to take the offering? And people are like, <laughs> and when that first started happening, there were no other churches that would ever cheer during the time of offering because people thought, how can, how can happiness and giving go hand in hand? How can cheering and giving go hand in hand? And years ago, uh, one of the things I discovered, and I, I came to the church with, and I said, this is really amazing to me because uh, it was happening in the churches throughout Korea that every time they would take an offering, they would stand up and they would cheer and they would be the loudest of all because they got to give. They considered it part of their worship. Their worship and my giving, I am, I am, I am, I'm, I'm going to be ecstatic. I'm going to be thrilled. I'm going to be excited because in my giving, what I'm actually saying is, God, I trust you. I trust you because I know what a good God you are. And if, you, if I have the opportunity to do this, then you're going to see this. And I will know that the blessings, any blessings that I have are those blessings that come from you and you alone. And it's a reason to celebrate. It's a reason to cheer. It's a hilarious type of giving. It's hilarious because the world looks at it and they don't get it. They don't understand it. That's strange. That's weird. But for the, the, the person who has put their faith and trust in Christ, and we know him and we know how he works and we know what he does, being able to give becomes a joy, becomes a thrill, becomes something exciting and something fun. I was sitting there last night. And uh, I was remembering, and I, I started texting um, my former brother-in-law, my nephew, and my son, Chase. And I just had to say, I guess, guys, do you remember that time? And I was texting them, and each one of them, and it's been like 20 years now, 20 years. And they still, they, they knew exactly what I was talking about. And uh, what I texted them was 20 years ago. Um, me and my uh, brother-in-law decided to take our sons, and they're probably about 9, 10 years old, and we were going to go on an adventure. And the adventure, we decided, was going to be to Nicaragua. And we were going to go to Nicaragua because there was a particular mission there that uh, we were a part of. And uh, so we got them on the plane. We went down, first of all, to Costa Rica, got a, a van that would drive us up across the border into Nicaragua and onto a, a, a city. It was not too far out of the city of Leon. And, uh, and so we're in this white van, we've got a driver, we've got a, a kind of a tour guide and translator for us, and uh, we're driving, uh, all six of us, in this van, and they take us to this one town outside of Leon called Chinandega. And in Chinandega, uh, they, they ask around where it is exactly that they're supposed to go, and they end up driving uh, down some of these small back roads. And eventually, we get to the place that we had planned to go for this trip, and it was, it was it's a place called, uh, it was really just the dumps of the city. And we drove through all these heaps and heaps and piles of garbage, and as you're driving down this little road, uh, we took a right through more heaps of garbage and trash, and that's when we begin to see them. They're called the children of the dump. And these little kids climbing over this garbage and this trash, they've been out there scavenging around looking uh, for whatever it is that they could find. That was how they live. And uh, they begin to see, the, see us in the van. They begin to move towards the van in hopes that we had something perhaps for them. And, and sure enough, we did. We took them over to this one particular uh, meeting area. And we begin to unload the food that we had brought. We begin to unload the toys that we brought. And... And, uh, and, and, and as we begin to do this, all of these little children, filthy as can be, begin to would just press in on you. If you wore a white shirt, it wasn't going to be white long. And they begin to press in on you. And, and, uh, and, and, and my son and my nephew, they were really just kind of overwhelmed with what, what we were doing right there. We were able to feed them. We ended up playing soccer with them and just had a whole day of fun with all these children of the dump right there. Finally, we got to the end of the day, and 
And we got back in our van, but that's when it was kind of weird for us. Uh, we got back in our van, and we were on such a high in, in giving. Have, have any of you ever been to something like that? And just been so excited that you were able to minister and love on people and, and to give and to give. And, and, we, and we were on such a high, and, and my son was, and, and my nephew was, and we were all going, oh my gosh, that was amazing. That was incredible. That was so awesome. And then we hit the reality of, can't we do something else? What else can we do? And, and that's when, that's when as, as we're driving down the road, we start to conspire a little bit. We say, how about this? How about this? And one of us comes up with the idea of we had a duffel bag and we didn't even need this duffel bag anymore. Uh, and, and we said, how about this? Because we're passing hut after hut after hut after hut after hut. Little dwellings that you couldn't, didn't hardly have a roof, didn't hardly have walls. And we said, let's, let's, let's do something. And, and, and that's when my, my, my son and my nephew and my brother-in-law and me, and uh, we started grabbing everything that we could, even cash, and dumping into this little bag. And we put all this cash and anything we had left in this duffel bag, and we kind of conspired. We said, okay, here's what we're going to do. And we're going we're gonna to pull up to the next hut that we see that looks like it's somebody who is definitely in need. And, uh, and then, Hutch, you're going to jump out and you're going to run as fast as you can down there and throw that back at the hut and run back and we're going to get out of here. <laughs> and so sure enough, we're driving down the road and we see this one little hut. And we knew it was the one we wanted to go to because it had, had uh, some, some laundry lines and, and little tiny clothes, you know, of children. And, and we said, all right, you ready? The guy's driving, stop the van, door slides open. And sure enough, we go, 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 go. And he jumps out and he runs, 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 runs down this little road. And he takes that bag, he throws it there at the house. He turns around and runs back. And just as he's getting back into the van, we see a young mom walk out with a little baby on her. Like, what in the world is going on? And we drove off laughing and screaming and high-fiving one another. We drove off hilariously giving. I'm never going to see that lady. Have no idea what it did for her. Don't know if it helped. Don't know at all what she was going through. Doesn't matter, does it? Doesn't matter because God knows. But I'll tell you something, guys. 20 years later, I think back to one of the funnest times of my life was a drive-by blessing. <laughs> That's your mission. That's your mission this week. It's to find somebody and do everything you can to keep them from knowing the way that you're going to bless them. Don't you dare tell anybody. Don't you dare get back home and say, you know what I did today? <laughs> Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, okay? Don't go to work and say, whoo, you guys, man, No. Don't you dare tell anybody. And some of you are going, but I don't, I don't have that much to give. Listen, listen. God can do a lot with your little. God's not impressed with how much you give. You know what impresses God? How much you give of what you have. Look here. A poor widow came by and dropped two small coins. And what impresses Jesus are not the big gifts of the others. What impresses Jesus, he says, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything that she has. The last thing I want you to write down when we give is to give like God. Give like God. 
What is that? We might write down the word sacrificially. Sacrificially. Listen, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. It's interesting to me, um, the things that excite us. The things that we get excited about, it's kind of funny to me sometimes. Yeah, the things that get us going. Kim and I were eating lunch the other day, and we sat uh, kind of close to a couple people, a couple ladies sitting at this table. You ever eavesdrop? You ever eavesdrop? I, mean, I, mean, I do all the time. And we we're kind of eavesdropping. And uh, the entire lunch, um, this one lady was talking to the other lady about uh, the greatest thing in the world, pickleball. Yeah, see? And uh, it was just it fascinated me to uh, us to, to hear her because she would say things like, uh, oh, I just love pickleball. I could play pickleball every day. Uh, I, I like pickleball because I like the way I feel after I play pickleball. I like the way I feel when I'm playing pickleball. So I play pickleball. She said, if I weren't eating with you today, I'd be playing pickleball. She goes, you got to play pickleball with me. She goes, the thing about pickleball is, is everybody in, in pickleball loves each other. And they want to help each other learn how to play pickleball. And she goes, you got to pick up a pickleball. You got to come play pickleball with me sometime. Well, I, she was a pickleball evangelist, okay? <laughs> But I was, I was amazed. She was so excited about pickleball. Oh, how, to be that excited about pickleball, that's amazing. But it's not just pickleball. All the other things we get excited about, right? We get excited about pickleball. We get excited about, there are some people who are so excited about bathrooms at Bucky's, you know? <laughs> that's all you can ever talk about. You even got a Bucky's on the back of your car, right? You know, and, or, or we get excited about um, Popeye's chicken. You love that chicken, the Popeye's. Right? <laughs> or we get excited about, about uh, Georgia Tech finally having a team that looks like they might play football, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you name it, we get excited about it, right? And sometimes we get excited about the trivial things, but not so much the main thing. What's the main thing? The main thing that should excite us? For this is how God loved you and me. He gave his one and only son. I just said give like God. He gave. He gave. He gave. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. If we... Could, if, if, if we... If, could you imagine if we really got so excited about how that he gave? If we really got that excited that it, it would be an unstoppable force in this world. That the giving that he, he gave to you and me and we're, we're so ecstatic about it. We're, we're so amazed by that. We're so overwhelmed by his grace that I can't stop talking. I can't stop giving. I can't stop loving in this world because of the love that he first gave. That changes everything, guys. That changes everything. Has it changed you to that extent? I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes. For God so loved the world that he gave. The question is, have you received? Have you received the love of the Lord Jesus Christ into your life for the forgiveness of your sin? If you haven't, here now. You can pray a prayer, something like this. Say, Jesus, I believe. I believe you died for me. And right now, the best I know how, I'm receiving you as my Savior. Come into my life, forgive me of my sin, and be my God and my Savior and my friend, best friend forever. Friend, as you pray that and you mean it with your heart, the Bible says you can know you have eternal life. So say, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Best decision 
you'll ever make. I'm going to ask us all now to stand together. What is communion? Communion is that celebration, that thrill, that joy of the life that has been given to you and I through the shed blood and the broken body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's remembering what he has done and celebrating what he has done. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood that has been spilled for you. As often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. And so, Father, we identify with your son, your son who gave so much. Father, help us now to be those agents of your love, to be those givers, givers like you have given to us. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.